Okay, uh, welcome. It is December the 10th, and this is live event for MyFibromyalgiaRelief.com. And um, <clears throat> I came across a, a great article this uh, week, actually just yesterday, and it's public. That's wonderful. It's about memory reconsolidation. It's about the person who uh, discovered or rediscovered it. <clears throat> and I wanted to basically just share this article with you today. Uh, I've spent, as I said before in the last few days, the last couple of weeks now getting word out about um, fibromyalgia relief and about the ice method and how it works. Uh, it feels really good to come back, read an article, and see this is the reason, I believe, that fibromyalgia relief and other kinds of chronic pain uh, relief can happen. I'm going to put it on screen share here, and uh, we'll get that set up, and it's going to be right here. And we're just going to be looking at um, this article together. The cool thing is it's published in Smithsonian Magazine, so you just go to smithsonian.com or just type in the title here, How Our Brains Make Memories. Um, and you're going to get this great article uh, written by Greg Miller, but it talks about Kareem Nader, who uh, made this discovery in the year 2000. It's a six-page article. I want to go a uh, great picture there, the brain, the amygdala <coughs> firing. Um, I want to go right to the end of the article here on page six. And perhaps it's better, it says, if we can rewrite our memories every time we recall them. This discoverer, Karim Nader, suggests that reconsolidation may be the brain's mechanism for recasting old memories in the light of everything that has happened since. Now that's an amazing statement. And if it's actually possible to do that, we get a tremendous amount of freedom in our lives. If we can actually recast old memories in the light of everything that has happened since, and then this line that catches me, <clears throat> in other words, it just might be what keeps us from living in the past. Memory reconsolidation might just be what keeps us from living in the past. That's a tremendous statement, and if it's possible, it opens up tremendous freedom in our life. Because for you and me, for all of us, we have all of our life experience that we react to, right? If you went across the street and got hit by a car when you were crossing in the crosswalk there, I'm pretty sure that if you go back to that same crosswalk, even if it was many years ago, your body will tense up when you walk across that street. Why? Because the memory is there of what happened the mind remembers this, the body responds to the mind. We live in the past crossing that crosswalk, even though the accident, getting hit, may have happened decades before. Imagine this in every aspect of our lives. You go to the store and there's a really grumpy, grumpy checkout person that just uh, is completely rude and berates you every time you go through that line. You're stuck going through that line because all the other lines are closed down or full or whatever. Your body is going to react as you approach the front of the line. Or if there's other options, you choose other options. Living in the past, when that checkout person has been grumpy to you, informs our present choices. And as children, we have all these experiences that are forming what we believe is safe and what we believe is unsafe. And as I said, I've been uh, part of a lot of Facebook groups now about fibromyalgia, and one of the posts yesterday that really struck me was this picture at school, and it was a dreadful picture, and the person writing, oh, all these terrible memories from going to school. And uh, the posts underneath the comments were, oh, me too, all these terrible memories. Well, what's the deal when you remember school Right? We are living in the past, and our body then is responding to that. If there were a way to free ourselves from that physical reaction, we might be a lot healthier. Okay, now, why does that seem strange to us, that we could free ourselves? I'm going to take you to page two of the article and tell you kind of what the traditional um, <clears throat> uh, sense of how these things work and it's called consolidation theory. Okay, and 
There's that. Okay. So one of the scientists who's done the most to illuminate the way that memory works is this Eric Kandel. And if you go down to uh, this paragraph right here now, it says, according to this view, the brain's memory system works something in a notebook. For a brief time before the ink dries, it's possible to smudge what's written. But after the memory is consolidated, it changes very little. Sure, memories may fade over the years like an old letter or even go up in flames if Alzheimer's strikes. But under ordinary circumstances, the content of the memory stays the same, no matter how many times it's taken out and read. Okay, That's <clears throat> the sense of going back to that cross rock, crosswalk where you were hit by a car 20 years ago, and when you walk across that crosswalk, the memory returns and your body tenses up in response to it. And this is our typical experience of life. But Nader says there's actually another dynamic going on. And if we could take advantage of this dynamic, perhaps we could create a situation in which we could once again walk across that crosswalk in complete calm and peace. Okay, that's actually, this is actually the science of what I've incorporated in working with the ice method. And it's why I believe it works. And it's why I believe that when I see these results, they're very explainable. Okay, so Nader, this Karim Nader in 2000, did this experiment to challenge this idea that you're always stuck with that memory. Okay, and the best you can do is like screw up your courage and get across the street. But when you do that, when you have to screw up your courage to get across that street because there's that old memory of the accident, it takes a toll on your body, right? Your body has to tense up. You have to consciously take this effort to move in the face of something that you feel innately stored memory as dangerous. All right, so um, I'm going to just <clears throat> read this paragraph here too because it talks about how memories are made. And this is what Nader then was going to start to manipulate. Okay, scientists have long known that recording a memory, so making that Twenty years ago, you get hit. That changes actually called synapses. Okay, a synapse is like a bustling port, complete with machinery for sending and receiving cargo. Neurotransmitters specialized chemicals that convey signals between neurons. All of the shipping machinery is built from proteins, the basic building blocks of cells. Okay, again, this is what I use in the ICE method. I love this article because it's pretty clearly telling us how these things are working in really simple terms. Okay, when a, an event happens, the connections between the neurons change and they are transmitted through these synapses and at the synapse are these proteins, these peptide molecules, short proteins, that um, carry actually emotional feeling and various different aspects of the memory. All right, so what experiment did Nader do? that was um, so uh, so changed the field. Okay? And the article does go on to say that there's still uh, dispute about all this, um, but there's over 500 articles now that have been published about memory reconsolidation, and as time goes on, it gets more and more accepted. And certainly for me, in the using of it, this is what makes sense. Okay, So what he did was he took a mouse, <clears throat> a rat, and he gave them an electrical shock, but right before the election, so that's the event of getting hit by the car, right? But right before the shock, he, he made a beep. And when they heard the beep, they knew that the shock was coming. Okay? So the beep then becomes a stressful event. That's like when you go up to that crosswalk, even though there's no particular um, danger about that crosswalk compared to any other one. When you go to that crosswalk where you got hit 20 years ago, your body tenses up. Okay, So there's a signal, crosswalk, 
that creates a response because of a memory. In the rat's case, getting shot. In your example case, getting hit by the car in the crosswalk 20 years ago. So what he says was, okay, if that's really consolidated, then there's no way to take away um, the content or the emotional content of that memory. <clears throat> but if instead, every time we reactivate a memory, it actually becomes um, labile is their word, it becomes malleable, fragile, just like when it's first being made. And scientists know that when we have an experience, it takes a number of hours for that memory to actually consolidate into our brain so that it, it is on the road to becoming permanent. Nader's theory was that, well, <clears throat> when that memory is reactivated, when we remember it, when we see the crosswalk, it actually has to be remade again. So, in that remaking process, could he interrupt it? Remember, it's peptides, it's proteins that carry all this. He injected a drug, a protein basically, that would stop the memory from being formed. Okay, now they knew that this worked on initial memories. Would it work when you went back to an old memory? Okay, so providing the beep reactivates the old memory of, oh, the shock is coming, or for you, standing at the crosswalk. He injects this drug that prevents the formation of a standard memory, and it turns out that it actually prevented the rat from feeling anxiety. And his advisor, he was a postdoc at the time, said, don't even bother with this, this isn't going to work. But he tested it on four rats, and it worked. He gave them this drug, then he produced the sound, and they weren't afraid. Now that's a huge finding and 500 papers have been uh, pr pr uh, produced since, 500 research papers on this topic. Because if this is the way that memory works, we now have a ton more flexibility. Think of how many people continue to live in reaction to early childhood events. Okay? Really traumatic ones. Sexual abuse or rape or accidents, or neglect, or uh, inappropriate actions, you know, uh, from teachers. Big ones, or even small ones that really had a big impact on, on us. I remember one time working with a guy, and he had become such a control freak. Why? Because he was a good baseball player, but when he was eight years old, his dad um, took him out of a game because he made an error. Seems like a small thing you'd get over, but for that guy, he was never going to be in a situation again where he was taken out of a game because he made an error. Every piece of his life became highly controlling oriented, highly perfectionist, and when I saw him, he thought he was going to die from stress. When we went back and reactivated that memory, just paying attention, reactivated that memory, and used a calming process which actually creates a different chemistry in our brain, so we don't have to inject like um, Nader did in his experiment with rats. Different consciousness produces a different chemistry, and now when he went back and observed that memory, all of a sudden there wasn't that anger and that shame and that fear in that memory. It was just, oh, my dad took me out of the game because I made a mistake. And that memory no longer controlled his present moment. As Nader says, this is what frees us from living in the past. And the ICE method, part of what I like about it is it's so simple, but it's very consistent with his chemistry. Instead of injecting with a drug, when you move into the calm state, your consciousness allows you to create a different chemistry in your brain. This comes from Candace Pert in her book, Molecules of Emotion. And when you do that, then it can have a different effect on the body. And this man's symptoms, terrible symptoms, such that he couldn't even get himself out of bed for six months, decreased and actually went away. And that comes from an understanding of Bruce Lipton's biology of belief that our cells, their function, is also controlled by peptides, by these proteins that go out and give instructions to our cells. Okay, so this memory reconsolidation, in my mind, is extraordinarily valuable and important. Um, 
So right here it says after Nader's initial findings, um, some neuroscientists poo pooed his work in journal articles, gave him the cold shoulder at scientific meeting. Okay. Then um, I want to show you there was a study that was done on post traumatic stress disorder. Um, where is that? That's right down here. It's on page four. A real-world test of Nader's theory of memory reconsolidation is taking place a few miles from his Montreal office at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. And they're doing an experiment that's very, very similar to with these rats. Okay? People become aware of their post-traumatic stress event, whether it was a car accident or a relationship or a wartime event. You activate the memory. Then they give these people a drug that blocks the reforming of the memory. And then 24 hours later, when they go back and reactivate the memory, the people are less stressed about the event that they're having a post-traumatic stress reaction to. Okay? This is a profound finding, I believe, because what you're able to do is actually go in and adjust the chemistry that's storing the emotion of that event that is causing such havoc in a person's life. You see how different this is from the understanding that memories and the emotional content of them are permanent and we're stuck with them. Most of us live most of our lives with that belief. And so what we do for people with PTSD is give typically will give a medication that will relieve the stress or dampen it, dampen the effect of it, the symptom of it on our body, right? The sweats or the anxiety or all those things. But it doesn't actually change the chemistry of the memory. And so the next day we need that drug again because that memory continues to have an impact on our life. So mostly we're treating symptoms, but with memory reconsolidation, if we can go back in and actually adjust the chemistry of that memory, then the panic, the fear, the anger, the terror can be replaced with calm. The memory doesn't reform with those same original peptides that it formed with. So one of the questions you might have is, why doesn't this just naturally happen? I mean, why is this such a great discovery? Because it really does, in most of our lives, seem like memories are permanent. And the thing is, this is my sense of it, um, that when that memory is activated, okay, we go back to that wartime, or let's just go back to that crosswalk when we were hit. We go back to the crosswalk, the memory is activated. It's 20 years after, but the memory is activated. We typically don't pay attention to that memory again, right? We get across the crosswalk and we carry on with our day. We go to work, we go to lunch, we go home, we go to dinner. There's a four-hour window in which these memories, once they're activated, re-glue. And unless we do something different, either inject this propanolol um, drug or do a calming exercise that consciously pays attention to that memory and brings it back, unless we do something, the original chemistry is there and the memory glues back the same way. So we need to make an intervention in order to reconsolidate these memories in a different way. And that's what the ICE method is all about. And that's what Nader and all these other researchers are studying. How do we do these interventions? Okay, I just took this um, finding when I first read about it a couple years ago and said, gosh, I really think this is how the emotional freedom technique works. I pursued it. Um, I think it's how other things work when we get relief. We actually change the way that we respond to the past so that we're free in the future and that has an effect both on our emotional health and our physical health. So this is what I wanted to share with you. I should come back here. How do we stop the screen share? There we are. We're back. I wanted to share this with you today because I think this is the core of how the ICE method works. Um, when I did that study with people who have fibromyalgia, I think this is why um, the symptoms went away for people. 
Now, if you go back to a stress state and start to put a load on a tired body again, you're going to get symptoms again. But if you keep coming back and using the ICE method, whenever a stress arises, as long as it's not the actual car hitting you, right? As long as it's not an actual immediate physical threat, then you can reconsolidate that and move back to a calm state such that there's no load on the body. And in most cases, the symptoms of fibromyalgia or other, some other chronic issues as well can reduce again or even eliminate. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the article. Scroll back up to the top. Um, get you back on screen share here for a minute. This is the article. It's called How Our Brains Make Memories. It's in smithsonian.com and it was published in May of 2010. Nadir's original discovery was in 2000. Um, another interesting piece is that back in the 60s there were some um, researchers who found that uh, they could interrupt memories uh, being reformed uh, right after they were activated, but it never really caught on. And this idea of consolidation that you make a memory it's permanent for the rest of your life uh, came to dominate or continued to dominate our understanding of how the brain works. I think this is a hugely exciting time. Um, just in the last year, three books have been published. You know, one of them is mine, Fibromyalgia Relief. It's based on memory reconsolidation. Another one is Unlocking the Brain. Uh, how do we get back? Another one is Unlocking the Brain. Uh, I've got that right here. And it's called Eliminating Symptoms um, at Their Roots Using Memory Reconsolidation. And that just came out in 2012. And then another book also came out in the spring of 2013, an academic book where Kareem Nader is a contributor, and there's like 14 different chapters by different researchers of an academic book called Memory Reconsolidation, and that's uh, publicly available as well. So my sense is that we're going to be hearing more and more about memory reconsolidation um, in the future, and I'm really happy that uh, it came to my awareness and I'm able to be uh, using it with people and seeing these kinds of results that are relieving both their physical symptoms and their emotional distress. So that's live event for today. Um, if you've gotten this far, and I hope you enjoyed it. I invite you to just be thinking about memory reconsolidation and its impacts. I'm going to invite you, as a closing exercise, to do just a very quick reconsolidation exercise. If there's anything in your life that you can identify that's distressing, just go ahead and observe it. When you observe it, actually there's a, there's a change at the synapse on the level of the proteins that have glued that memory together and it becomes labile. Okay, this is the article. It becomes fragile. So identify that. Identify the emotion in it, the experience. Notice if you feel it anywhere in your body. That's Bruce Lipton. And our body responds to these peptides as well. Now, let's move to another state. Let's create a different chemistry that we'll put back into that synapse so that the distress of this memory that you've activated lowers. There are many different techniques to do this, but you want to just basically get into an alternative state, a different state from the one that's distressing you about this memory. And the method that I use that works uh, for almost everyone that I use it with is just to observe a single point. You can use it somewhere in the room that you're in or on the screen or whatever. When you observe a simple point, your consciousness now you are choosing with your consciousness to not focus on the memory that you just activated, but to focus on a single point. And when you do that, the chemistry in your body actually begins to change. Because the chemistry of your body, of your mind, of your consciousness responds to whatever you're paying attention to. A tiger's coming at you, the chemistry of your body is like, run away. Somebody comes and makes you angry, the chemistry of your body is to fight. If you observe something very simple, the chemistry of your body relaxes. You produce these proteins that correspond to this relaxed state. When you're ready, observe a second point, a little distance away from the first one. It's a calming exercise, producing a different chemistry for your body to respond to. The body says, oh, 
Not much I have to do out there to support you. More of the body's energy now can turn towards rest and restoration of your cell structure, your body, your organs, all those things. And now part of why I love this exercise of the two points is that between any two points you can imagine that there's a space that's empty. You got a wall back there or whatever, but between the points is a space that has nothing in it. Observe that space. Because now with your consciousness, when you are observing nothing, you are giving the signal to the cells of your body that there is nothing that they need to support you in reacting to the outside world. Because there's nothing out there that you're reacting to consciously. The cells of your body move into rest and restoration mode. You are producing a chemistry of calm and peace. Now we haven't reconsolidated the memory yet that you brought up a few moments ago. Because we've just moved into a different state. And what happens for most people most of the time is, oh, that feels cool. And then you go off to work or whatever the next thing is. And you never come back and put that different chemistry into the original memory. Okay? And here's how you do that. Nader did it by injecting his rats with a chemical that went into the synapse and interfered with the restoration of the old memory. Now, as I said, you got four hours to do this in. But within the space of a couple minutes of feeling that distressing memory, activating it, you went to the calm space, created a different chemistry. Now, how do we bring it back into that original memory that was distressing? And this is the piece that's so simple but so different from our daily life, right? Normally, finish watching this, go on to the next YouTube video or whatever you're doing, go make lunch, go to work, take care of kids, whatever it is. And you keep going, and four hours later, that old memory that came up that bothered you, going across that crosswalk where you got hit 20 years ago, that glues together in the same old way. We can interfere with that process from the calm state. I just want you to observe back to that distressing memory. And in the observation back, it's a similar phenomenon to when Kareem Nader injected his rats with a chemistry that stopped the old memory from forming the same way. From this calm space, observe back to the distressing memory. You are literally bringing the chemistry of calm back to whatever the memory was and whatever the emotion that was stored at the time of that memory. And when you observe back, you're going to notice that it's different. It may not be completely calm at this point because there might be a lot of aspects to it. But probably the exact thing, I, mean, I would guess more than just probably, but very likely in my experience. I haven't actually met anyone where the memory has been exactly the same because this is the chemistry of what's happening. I believe it happens predictably and dependably when you observe back to the exact thing that you identify that was distressing. This chemistry of calm that comes back and the feeling, the emotional feeling is different. It may be completely calm or it may have calmed that particular piece and now something else shows up. So if someone feels fear the first round, you know, they're fearful about this memory where they were abused. You go back and you calm that. It may take a couple of rounds and typically then someone will say, gosh, I feel angry now. But it makes sense that you're angry now. And that you didn't feel that before because the first and primary feeling was one of safety, of anger, uh, of fear, of safety. And when that's calmed down, then it makes sense that, gosh, I'm really angry about what happened. Okay? So that's the technique that I use, identifying an issue, moving to a calm state, and then coming back and exchanging the peptides. That's why I call it ICE, I-C-E, identify, calm, exchange, the ICE method. And it's based on this article, or the findings of memory reconsolidation. Put it back up one last time, and then we'll call it a, call it a session here. But how our brains make memories? Smithsonian.com. You can look that up and read it. Great article. Let's see. All right. Well, thanks a lot for the live event today. Have a great day. I'll post this up on, on the website. It's there for a day. Uh, for everyone to view, and then I'll put it in the library for our membership. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.